Dear colleagues, good afternoon and welcome all of you. On behalf of COPAN and my esteemed co-chair, Kate Templeton, we are very happy to welcome you on this afternoon session. SAMP collection needs challenge and future. We want to focus on aspects of pre-lab analysis, quality and effectiveness of sampling, because there's huge differences as we will learn during this symposium. My name is Christoph Splinner. I'm a consultant physician in infectious diseases in Munich, Germany, and also an adjunct teaching professor, professor at Technical University in Munich. Before we start, we want to introduce you um, to take part in the polling questions that you can find in your ACMED app. You're more than welcome to help us to learn about the audience that is joining our session in this afternoon's and we are interested in what your background is. Please feel free to scan either the voting QR code here or use your ECMIT app to reply as soon as possible. Um, I need to open the poll, and now we hopefully learn some more information about you and your background. I did also suggest that it might be just here for the lunch, but that wasn't an option. <laughs> okay, well, so that means the majority of you is uh, with a medical background as physicians, but almost um, same proportion as lab professionals. So we are happy um, to focus on those uh, both groups and this is probably also affecting the questions we want to discuss later. I will stop that polling question because we have a second question brought to you. Um, and this is directly straightforward on the topic we want to discuss about the sample collection for microbiology diagnostics. And in this case, there's more than one option available. So please feel free to select more than one option. We want to know what future sample um, collections should focus on for microbiology diagnostics. Oh, sorry. I need to start again. Now the polling should be open. I just allow five more seconds. And with that, I can conclude that improving the collection and preservation of the sample, as well as standardization and easiness of use, are important aspects for sample collection in microbiology. With that, I want to hand over to introduce the first speaker to my esteemed colleague, Kate Templeton. Well, welcome everybody. And um, our first speaker for this lunchtime session is um, Professor Marek Schmier from the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine in McMaster University, Hamilton, on Canada. Um, um, Marek tells me that he was born in London, England, but then worked in London, Ontario for a long time. Anyway, um, so uh, his title of his talk is Sample Collection for Respiratory and Gastrointestinal Pathogens. How can we improve it? Uh, thank you, Kate and uh, Christoph. So financial uh, disclosures, I'm not being paid to be here. I do this because I actually love sample collection and things like that. I'm a salaried physician. I also give advice to the Ontario government so they don't let me travel on anyone else's dime anymore, which is kind of too bad. No other disclosures. This is the original Likert scale of Plato 2,500 years ago. So wise men speak because they have something to say, fools because they have to say something. So remember when you're filling out your evaluation, it goes from fool to wise, and hopefully I'll be at least in the middle or higher. 
I have three objectives in the next 15 minutes to discuss optimal collection and preservation of specimens for respiratory virus testing, for gastrointestinal pathogen testing, and to look at some other anatomical site testing. So we'll start with respiratory viruses. They've been both the good and the bad of our existence for the last three years, but I've spent over 20 years looking at influenza and RSV and other respiratory viruses, particularly from the pre-analytic point of view. How do we better collect? How do we better preserve? Because a lot of the debate in the literature has been about what test we apply to it, but I would suggest that it's equally important that we collect and preserve that well. And of course, that's really come to the fore during SARS-CoV-2, especially when we ran out of every swab type and every medium type and had to multiply test every new swab. And I don't know about you, I've had at least 100 swabs up my nose as part of those endeavors so that we can safely do things for our patients. In the original years, it was always nasopharyngeal aspirates, and most of us have got away from that as being messy and a biohazard, but certainly nasopharyngeal swabs have become the standard for both pediatric and adult throughout most of the world. But through COVID and in our lab for many years before, we looked at alternate specimen types as well, things like nasal swabs, throat swabs, mid-turbinate swabs, which I'll discuss a bit. We've heard to, uh, earlier this morning about things like saliva. We've also done oral swabs and, of course, sputum. So the issue, though, is how to actually show that these work properly. And so we obviously want to detect infection, but when you have low prevalence of virus, you may have to study hundreds or even thousands of people to do that well. So can we have surrogate measures so that we develop methods of swabbing um, that tell us we're likely to succeed or likely not to succeed? And so one of our first measures was epithelial cells of nasopharyngeal swabs. We did this because we used to do direct fluorescent antibody and antigen testing uh, in our laboratory, and we automatically quantified cells to tell you that you had a lousy specimen or a good specimen. And then we developed things like beta-actin, other labs have done that as well, and we showed beta-actin was an almost perfect proxy to uh, respiratory epithelial cells with an R-squared of about 99. And then more recently, many of us have been doing RNAs P as an adequacy control in our COVID testing. And so the important concept is you need a quality measure of sampling effectiveness. And if we're going to improve sampling, somebody's got to develop that measure. I think it's well developed for nasopharyngeal and nasal swabs. It's actually poorly developed for most of the other types of specimens we're going to talk about. Secondly. When the uh, flock swab was invented back in about 15, 20 years ago, we had a perfect opportunity to try to understand what's the relationship between quality, the number of cells, the number of infected cells, and how to then diagnose a greater proportion of patients. And so we performed this study initially on volunteers. So when the flock swabs first came out, we took laboratory volunteers, we randomized order of different swabs, and we performed not just nasopharyngeal swabs, but I was also curious about nasal swabs. So on the, in each of those uh, graphs, what you see on the, uh, uh, in the red is the nasopharyngeal swab done with the uh, old swab. That's the conventional rayon swab. You can think of it like um, a cotton wrapped around, uh, you know, it's, it's actually nylon wrapped around a wire versus the flock swab, which you can think of like a brush, perpendicular nylon fibers at a 90 degree angle. And essentially you're just brushing the nasopharynx better and therefore getting more cells. And so we had two people in the lab independently count the cells blinded to which swab it, it was, and we could show a highly statistically significant 50% uh, um, improvement in the number of cells. If you now turn your attention to the blue part of the graph, here are the nasal swab sampling. So the nasal swabs, the same swab but sampling in the nasal site did not sample as many cells but the better swab sampled more cells. So it had us lead to the hypothesis that could we improve sampling the nose by sampling more cells from the nose. So we actually sent one of my master's students to the, the cadaver lab. We measured cadavers and their mid-turbinate bones and came up with distances and so on. And then we spent about two years developing a better swab, which simply asked the question, can we better and comfortably sample the number of cells? And if so, can we approximate the quality of an azopharyngeal swab? And so we wanted to simply increase surface area, increase the cells collected, 
and therefore give us good sensitivity. We also wanted to develop something where people could self-collect. It's hard to self-collect a nasopharyngeal swab, but we wanted to be able to self-collect uh, mid-turbinate swabs. We also felt that parents could collect from their children more comfortably than a medical worker. And we could also, very importantly, quantify and do repeat uh, collection. So this is the swab that we developed. It's called the mid-turbinate swab. Um, and we've done this in many, many studies, but it's also been used in clinical trials of antivirals, where this is done serially, and then the area under the curve is the measure of antiviral activity. And so that's been done both for influenza antivirals as well as for RSV antivirals. And we've done this in a number of cohort studies. We've done probably about 10,000 of these in various self-collected studies. This was back in swine flu 2009, 2010, where we had university students living in residence self-collect every week. Uh, and then we looked for not only influenza, but seasonal coronaviruses, RSV, et cetera. And in fact, we mostly found rhinovirus, although we certainly found uh, influenza as well as seasonal coronas. The other thing I mentioned is if you can get a good quality reproducible specimen, you can do this serially. And you can do this particularly if it's easy to collect. So these are three patients self-collected at home, uh, influenza viral loads back again 2009, 2010. First patient there started with log 8 of virus. Uh, and within a day had no detectable virus. He's the one that we treated with oseltamivir. 21-year-old straight off the plane had gone to Mexico for a nice vacation and came back with swine flu. The other two were not treated because public health decided nobody was allowed to treat with oseltamivir except if you were a high risk of hospitalization. So in fact, this was a couple that infected one the other, and the one person worked with elderly people. And although we had no empiric basis to know when you're infectious and when you're not, at day eight, the person was going to go back to work with, uh, with uh, elderly patients with cognitive impairment. And on the basis of these viral loads, we said, please don't do that. We, you may well infect other people. So again, it's not just diagnosis. More and more we need tools that can quantify because those may be important prognostically. They may be important in terms of uh, antiviral responses of drugs and so on. Now this is actually a study uh, that I did on myself. I gave a talk at a virology symposium last May in Florida and courtesy of Florida and a lack of any sort of precautions, I came back with COVID. I took the precautions, nobody else did, but I came back from COVID. So I stayed home for 14 days, got 50 swabs in various transport media and performed experiments for the betterment of humanity. So this is one of those. This was 14 days, same time every day I did a mid-turbinate swab. And here you've got log E gene, so basically going from about log six or a million copies. And what you can see is a slight increase for the first few days, a stabilization, and then a rapid decrease. Now I'm gonna get better, I'm not immunocompromised, I've had my four shots, but you can imagine doing this with patients who have a transplant or get remdesivir or get Paxlovid and so on. This allows you very easily to do serial viral loads and to understand what's happening to individuals. And this is probably my favorite slide. These are five swabs. I actually took 10 swabs because I took them with and without antigen. These are five swabs I took about a minute apart in the order that you see. And so on the left-hand side, you have an anterior nasal swab. Now the kits we get, we all in Canada got, you know, gazillions of these antigen kits. I've probably done 30 antigen tests on myself and about 100 PCRs. But it's a nasopharyngeal swab, which is not designed for the anterior nose, but we're all supposed to self-collect in the anterior nose. And so this is what happens. You get a very, very faint uh, bar over here. Sorry, I don't know if I've got my mouse there. Um, sorry, I'll go back one. Um, so if you see here, the T line is your antigen. You get a very, very faint antigen. A minute later, I'm doing a nasal swab. So I'm doing a stiffer swab in the nose, um, and I get a better line. Then I do an oral nasal, mouth and nose. Finally, I do the mid-turbinate, and I get my daughter, who's now a trained paramedic, to do a nasopharyngeal swab. The first four self-collected. The final one is professionally collected. And you can see that T line goes from very, very faint to much, much stronger. If you look at the bottom, the E gene and log base 10 goes from three to about four and a half. So about a 1.5 log difference, same nose, probably same amount of virus, but a different swab and a different sampling technique. And then if you look at the CD values, you can improve the CT value by six. 
We spend a lot of time comparing different tests to get a log to one log half log improvement. Most of the commercial companies out there spend all of their time on the CT value. Very few of them spend time on trying to improve the swab and how to collect it. And this is then stability. So this is a different concept, but when we have a swab, we want to self-collect it, and then we want to preserve that. And we want to preserve it at least for 24 hours if you're offering, you know, quickly getting it to the lab and so on. But a lot of the time, if you get overwhelmed, it may be several days before a swab was processed at the peak of COVID. Now, this isn't COVID. This is influenza. This is a mock study. But what we did is we took cultured influenza virus, used uh, a swab with various transport media. We did this multiple times at multiple temperatures. And what we can show is that viral transport media like VTM, UTM, and so on, pretty stable at room temperature for at least a week, very stable refrigerated or frozen out to at least three weeks, but deteriorate fairly quickly within days if they're stored at 37 degrees. We looked at alcohol-based media. We also looked at no uh, medium at all. Today, we would have repeated this with a molecular medium, and we've done that. Molecular media give you something even better than the viral transport medium. You have essentially no fall off um, at about seven days, even at 14 days to the molecular medium. So then let's turn our attention to gastrointestinal pathogens. We've discussed respiratory pathogens, but here I want to focus a bit more on the medium that we might use. So gastrointestinal pathogens may be bacterial, Salmonella, Shigella, Shiga toxin-producing E. coli, etc. And many of us have gone to molecular methods rather than culture. It's more sensitive. It's quicker. But you can use one of three things. You can use bulk stool. Basically, poop, put it in a container, send it to the lab. Great, except if it's leaks, not fun to collect. You can actually swab the stool. So rather than sending in stool, send me a swab in a medium. That's a lot tidier for me to deal with at the lab end. It may also be easier to collect. You can swab a diaper from a child. You can perhaps even swab the rectum. And that's the third thing. You can actually do a rectal swab. And the advantage there is you can collect it at that time. On the other hand, there's an invasiveness to collecting a rectal swab, whereas when you send them with a container to get their own poop, we're not exposing them to what can be maybe occasionally an uncomfortable thing. At the same time, it's more immediate, and I'll show you in a moment, it may be actually better than a, a stool. Now, this is a study my, uh, one of my postdocs did in our lab where she took uh, various viruses and bacteria uh, and using uh, an assay, we here we're just showing you CT values. So the higher, the worse, the lower, the better. And if you just look at bulk stool, meaning poop in a, in a, in a clean uh, plastic container, versus the 50 microliters of the fecal swab. Fecal swab is essentially just carry Blair. It's a good medium for molecular as well as for culture if you need to culture. And what you can see is essentially that first and third bar from each of those organisms is essentially the same. And we've published this in JCLIN Micro. So basically, you can swab swab stool, put it into a medium like Carrie Blair, and get equivalent results to getting the, the, the stool sent to you. But you can also swab the rectum itself directly. And this is a study done by David Goldfarb. Uh, we did this together in Botswana on children get, uh, hospitalized with diarrhea at uh, the Princess Marina Hospital in Botswana. And so what David designed with, uh, with several of us is a, is a short three centimeter from the, the tip to the stopper, a, a, a flocked head. This would be inserted when children were seen in the emergency department. And on average, we were able to get a specimen two and a half hours quicker than if you waited for a stool. And we even had children dying of diarrheal disease when there was never a stool passed. And so it actually allowed us to figure out what were the common causes of, uh, of, of uh, diarrhea in Botswana. And this is from the paper that resulted, and if you can ignore most of it, and just focus on the two arrows. For bacterial pathogens, we would have been happy to have an equivalent, a 95%. Well, we actually found the swab was better than stool. So 93% uh, sensitive compared to about 70% for stool. This was quite a surprising. It suggests that a lot of these pathogens were found in the rectal cells themselves. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, we were quite surprised, but uh, other groups have looked at this as well. Viruses, it was slightly worse, but still comparable. But the two together, we can say that the rectal swab at least is good, probably better, and a lot faster, quite comfortable, and in the setting of a hospitalized child, quite easy to justify doing a, a really good test like this. 
And then you can extend some of these concepts to other anatomical sites. We've done oral swabs, both for antibodies as well as for DNA uh, collection for things like mononucleosis. We've done throat swabs, still having difficulty figuring out what the right marker is because we've tried to do self-collection studies for throats and we can't quite figure out whether bacterial or human markers work better. Neither of them work as well as they do for respiratory. For skin lesions, we had patients with uh, MPOX who would self-sample their, their lesions. So again, what would be the marker to tell you that you've got a good swab? And finally, of huge interest is for STI testing. In my HIV clinic, most people self-test. They'll do a urine that's easy, self-collected vaginal, self-collected rectal. Although for throats, we still have nurses do those. We're not yet convinced patients take a, a well-collected uh, throat swab. So just to conclude, we've talked about what's the optimal sample type. Obviously, you've got things like nasopharyngeal or bulk stool, but is there something that's easier to collect? Can we enable self-collection? And what's an appropriate quality marker if we're going to do that? We've talked a little bit about type of transport medium. We want to maintain integrity, ideally have a leak-proof container, and the smaller the better, and then something that will aid in extraction processing. So I'll conclude with that. I wanted to thank Santina Castricciano, who taught me a lot of the virology I know and uh, worked with me on a lot of these projects, and the uh, late Daniele Triva, who was a very enthusiastic supporter when we developed with him the uh, mid-turbinate swab many years ago. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we probably have time for one quick question, if, uh, if somebody has that. Otherwise, we will move on to... We haven't got a huge amount of time. We need to finish at uh, 1.15. So, OK, that would be great. Can you go to the microphone just so everyone can hear? I'm Anna de Vries from the Netherlands. Um, I'm, you were talking about the throat swab, and that's always puzzling me. Um, do we do... Um, the um, just the place of the of the of the um, how you call them um, uh, mid in, in the front or in the back you go to the yeah. to the back uh, side of the of the pharynx. I think that's very important. Where which, what kind of throat swab you do? So you're you're right. I mean you can do, but but uh, throat swabs add to a mid turbinate, but they're not as good as a mid turbinate. So we did a study of of students with acute sore throats. We did mid terminates and throat swabs, and, and the, the mid terminates were appreciably better for catching viruses. Obviously, they weren't good for group A strep, which the throat swab is good for. Um, but yeah, what do you do? You know, for group A strep, you want to do tonsils as well as the oropharynx. Uh, when we do oral swabs, we do oral buckle. Lots of people do tongue or back of the mouth. So in studies, people have to dis define this. And then again, if you're going to do it serially, you want to make sure your reproducibility of doing two swabs is very, very tight. Otherwise, the quantification doesn't, doesn't matter. But I think for every virus, MPOX was better oral than nasopharyngeal. You know, measles, other things. We need to know which compartment to sample. And I don't think we can extrapolate whether throat is better for one virus versus another. So, OK. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think there's many more questions, but we will. Um, I'll hand over to my co-chair, and we'll move on to the ne next talk. Well, Marit, thanks. Um, with the next talk, I want to invite Professor Donatella Placidi from Brescia University in Italy, and she's going to speak about new trends in microbiology, self-collection, and the microbiome. Donatella, please, the stage is yours. Thank you. So uh, let me first of all thank you uh, thanks, Copan, to invite me in this uh, wonderful congress. I'm really honored to be in this melting pot of culture and uh, science. I'm an occupational physician and uh, an epidemiologist, and you say why, <laughs> why she's here. And uh, my main interest is uh, to study and prevent pollution um, and uh, how pollution impacts health. My university in Brescia is a, uh, is a province that is known to be uh, one of the most industrialized in the world, the most mainly in, uh, in Europe. And, uh, and uh, the main expertise since the, the prehistorical era uh, in our province is metal working. Uh, metal working uh, um, brings our industry to, industries to be known everywhere worldwide to uh, be innovative, to be um, uh, uh, high-quality industries, but the other side of, of the medal 
is uh, the pollution, uh, particularly rich of metals and uh, particularly high. Unfortunately, last year Lancet published a paper where Brescia compared as the first province uh, for the amount of PM um, uh, in, the, in the air. So, um, my research, I have a clinical background, but uh, I started to move from uh, the factories and the workers to uh, the public health and the general population. And um, I uh, started this with uh, some studies similar to this one that is uh, still ongoing uh, uh, from 2007 and uh, is funded uh, for the next uh, five years. So uh, we uh, were collecting and uh, we are collecting a lot of um, um, useful um, sample on a huge uh, wide um, uh, range of population. You can see, for example, uh, general population, uh, people affected by diseases or um, fragile uh, or even workers. Um, this uh, public health impact of metal exposure cohort, fine cohort, is a pretty unique sample of subject and uh, they are really well characterized for um, uh, historical measurements, um, uh, both environmental and biological, uh, for a neuropsychological, neurocognitive uh, uh, test. Uh, we added neuroimaging, we have added uh, microbiome. This is my interest and this is uh, my, my new interest and uh, this is the uh, reason uh, uh, I'm here. And uh, we started to investigate the role of microbiome in metal exposure brain functional anatomy and uh, in neurotoxicity, neurotoxicity. So we starting to perform two pilot studies uh, that um, will guide us uh, uh, for uh, uh, protocol design and uh, uh, to um, uh, start with the larger uh, cohort. Uh, so we are planning to um, expand our study uh, including the oral, nasal, and gut microbiome. And uh, um, this uh, will provide, uh, we hope, a more comprehensive assessment of the subject microbiota. And uh, uh, as a, an epidemiologist, um, you know that epidemiologists need uh, to form databases. Starting from field, enrolling cohort of subject or patient, and um, the desirable goal uh, is the statistical power to detect the association, the mediation effect, the interaction, and we need to make all efforts uh, to establish the way to reach the best compliance of each of our participants. Uh, you know, uh, we um, uh, we need. Um, to, uh, uh, we have a lot of requirements. We need their attention, we need the time, we need biological sampling, uh, we need to, um, un uh, to ask the an increasing availability to come back for the longitudinal perspective that now we need to um, study and to deepen these uh, items and these, uh, uh, these goals. Uh, so, to collect valuable data, uh, the patient or the subject performance and preferences um, are crucial and critical. This is the way my research group have approached self-collection. We started from gut and uh, we have some frustrating experience, let me check, like this one, but also very good experience with uh, um, a very high rate of um, far favorable uh, to this uh, approach. Uh, in, few, um, in a few recent years, research on microbiota field has taken significant step forward, mainly thanks to the development of new technologies which allow analyzing the composition and the function of the bacterial flora by deeping certain complex complex aspects that were previously unavailable. 
Analyzing easily collectible test tissue is becoming crucial to reach the multifaceted growing of the epidemiological study. Recent study highlight the possible ways to identify subjects at a higher risk of developing the disease. The key to prioritize preventive intervention. From a clinical perspective, early diagnosing, diagnosis and patient stratification are the key to maximize the effectiveness of the treatment and to slow or to prevent disease progression. When I started approaching microbiome, I was wondering which is the site to test the, micro the microbiome to reach my project aims. This is an example uh, from a 10 years ago paper on upper airways microbiota. For my not expert point of view, uh, quite complex. And uh, I was concerned uh, not only to face difficulty in sampling, but also about the site representativeness. With this recent nice and complex figure, I want to illustrate an updated version of the, the way air pollution could affect human health. Very intriguing uh, scenario. The growing amount of literature have this depicted as a wide scenario to explore. You can see here um, that we uh, are exploring not, not only uh, the more ancient gut <laughs> Uh, microbial, but also oral, pharyngeal, lung, bacterial, skin. And um, on, on the other hand, despite the number of papers, a pretty big number of items are still in early, in early stage, starting from the standardization of sampling method and uh, studies uh, heterogeneity and many influencing uh, factors could drive easily to inconsistent and frustrating results. Two slides on how to change the approach to airways microbiome from sputum microbiome. Um, this uh, uh, sputum microbiome um, is obtained through a complicated collection protocol, complicated for my vision, from uh, inhaled sequences of saline um, nebulization via ultrasonic and uh, to expectoration. Uh, the paper uh, arrived to interesting results, uh, despite in, uh, only 100 patients and health subjects. Uh, progressively, literature um, go forward to nasal microbiome, to explore na nasal microbiome. More easy to collect. The human nasal passages, as major human pathogens, and the nasal bacterial microbiota shows distinct changes over the span of human life and disruption by environmental factors might be associated with both short and long-term health consequences, such as susceptibility to viral and bacterial infections or even disturbances of the immunological balance. And uh, many authors uh, underline the critical need for more and larger perspective longitudinal study, ideally exploring the host microbiota disease interactions and the relationship on these to severity of the disease. Moreover, nasal microbiota is easy to collect, to self-collect, and this could facilitate longitudinal multiple sampling and trajectory drawing. The study on microbiome and its potential association with human health and disease is still at the dawn. A rapid expansion of the literature on the composition of the, of the um, in health and acute infection reflects a growing recognition of the exciting possibility for future microbiota-derived and microbiota-targeted approaches for both prevent and treat the disease. And, uh, in this and the previous slide, I listed the conclusion of this nice review uh, on bacterial microbiota of the human nasal passages. To arrive to the conclusion, let me introduce a few uh, slides on future perspectives. This, tables, this table represents metals in biological metrics 
from nasal swaps. A pilot study on a little group of subjects to start to explore this possibility. Self-collection will boost research on underexplore, promising biological metrics. The COVID pandemic and the need for rapid, reliable testing has heightened interest in saliva as a convenient and reliable testing me medium for infectious disease. Saliva's use as a health indicator did not start with, with COVID and nor will it end with this virus. Researchers and laboratories, laboratoricians are investigating oral fluids potential in detecting, for example, air disease, human papillopan virus, um, cancer related to head and neck, breast cancer, lung cancer, as well as monitoring treatment efficacy, detecting disease recurrence, and stratifying patient risk. As a testing medium, saliva, unlike blood and other bloody flu body fluid, is easy to collect, handle, and store. Uh, add uh, that to increasingly sensitive lab instrument that is uh, essential and crucial, um, it seems like there should be a lot of opportunities to exploit saliva in, saliva in the clinic. Personally, I'm really fascinated from the possibility to study microbiome combined with metabolome. This table is representing the growing attention on the literature on these two items, but also to the combination of this item, the little uh, blue uh, line. And uh, we have recently tested saliva uh, metabolome in a subset of our cohort, and we are expected to combine this result also with the nasal uh, microbiome. This recent paper published on Nature effectively represents the perspective of the research field. And uh, finally, I recommended to read this nice paper on science. Um, if you want to deep your knowledge on exposome, a recent frontier of research. As you can see, exposome is um, the uh, non-genetic uh, com combination of factor that could be associated with disease and health uh, outcomes. The large-scale consortia for, um, allow, for example, genome-wide studies to detect many common genetic traits related to health phenotypes. It is estimated that sample size uh, from uh, 100,000 to million are needed to explain a substantial portion of the genetic components of common, common chronic disease. For the multitude of factors within the exposome, most of which likely uh, sm with small effects, similar or even greater sample sizes would be required for future environmental studies on these uh, items, on this uh, research uh, field. So to coming back to my commitment for my presentation, for this presentation, I'm concluding highlighting how self-collection could address the challenges improving our technology to screen for exogenous chemicals and their biological consequences, and higher throughput rates and lower the costs. And um, maybe uh, this kind of collection could facilitate what researchers are, uh, really need to establish, that is uh, the so-called network science. Thank you. Donatella, thank you for that excellent talk. Is there any questions from the audience? We also invite the online guests to send in questions. We are monitoring them as well. And I see there is one question from the audience. Jerry. Yeah, hi, Donatella. <laughs> we've, we've met. Um, uh, 
your, uh, I'm wondering uh, your vision for the nasal uh, microbiome um, study. Is it uh, is your vision to do uh, self collection? Or will the participants do self collection? And if the answer is yes, what is um, what is your plan for sample adequacy controlling, if if any? Well, um, actually, we started with a little pilot uh, without self collecting nasal swab. Um, because we started before COVID, but <laughs> as we uh, have a pretty good result, you can read some results in a poster uh, uh, here in this Congress, uh, we are planning to, uh, to really um, increase the, the sample size, and, uh, and these uh, could, uh, could be uh, only by means, but through the server collection, because uh, nowadays uh, with COVID and with all the other tricky questions that we are uh, having with, uh, with the subject and uh, with the patient, uh, uh, it is a, a very good uh, uh, option to, to face uh, this problem. And uh, um, now we, don't having, we are not having a genetic profile of our uh, subject. But uh, yes, uh, as a uh, to collect subject, uh, it is uh, easy to um, uh, uh, to create some subset of, of subject or some other. Uh, we we need to ask for funding, but I I hope to to be able to to ask for them soon. Perfect, Donatella. In interest of time, there's just one quick online question with uh, one quick answer. Is the Smart Enet kit suitable for the collection of oral rectal nasal samples for your microbiome study? Just one sentence, please. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Uh, so the question is uh, if... Uh, the Smart Enet kit, whether it's suitable for collection from all sites? Well, uh, I'm not a technician. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm scared to not be pre pre precise in my, in my answer. Okay, but, uh, so, so let's revise to the manufacturer. Then. Yeah, I think <laughs> okay. so, yes. Perfect. Sorry. Okay, thanks for the excellent talk. And in the interest of time, I have to hand back to Kate. Uh, so if, uh, for our final um, talk from this session, um, I'd like to welcome Professor um, Gerald uh, Cangelosi from the University of Washington, Seattle, USA, um, who's going to talk about non-invasive oral swab sampling for tuberculosis, applying our lessons from COVID-19. All right. Well, well thank you. And um, thank you to the organizers for inviting us. Um, I saw on Christoph's uh, poll at the beginning that there was not a place to check for public health scientists, but, I, but there was 2% of respondents checked other, and I guess that was me and Donatella, because <laughs> we're both public health scientists. And um, actually, uh, swabbing is an important tool for public health science, because if you really want to increase the end, and especially go out into community settings for sampling, um, it really has to be a non-invasive and a very easy type of sample to collect. And that's what I'll be talking about. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, for tuberculosis, which is uh, my main interest, the, um, the traditional sample of choice is sputum, which is this uh, gloppy material that comes from deep, uh, deep in the airways. It is cultured or uh, there are PCR tests that are applied. Why look beyond it? Well, um, partly is for occupational safety of, of healthcare workers, but, um, and there are also certain types of TB patients that are unable to produce sputum very easily. But our main interest is improving the logistics of collecting uh, sampling in, um, of sampling for active tuberculosis in community settings, outside of clinical settings. It is the missing millions of TB cases that go undetected that never even make it to the clinic. These are the people that are responsible for most tuberculosis transmission. So when you want to go out into settings like workplaces, uh, refugee centers, uh, schools, um, it, the notion of collecting sputum from, from people uh, on, at a high scale is basically a non-starter. And uh, something fast like a swab 
is uh, a better choice. And we learned a lesson about this with the COVID-19 pandemic. You might remember right at the start of 2020 when the uh, uh, virus first made its way to Europe and the, and the United States, the sample of choice was the nasal pharyngeal swab, which Mark uh, spoke about. And that's uh, otherwise known as the brain tickle. It goes deep into the base of the skull, very invasive. It's something that uh, really only a healthcare worker can safely collect. Um, uh, very quickly, there were a, a, a number of studies to uh, assess uh, more accessible sampling sites, uh, especially um, anterior nair sampling. And in fact, we were one of the uh, uh, first groups to, to report that. And anterior nasal sampling is not quite as sensitive as nasal pharyngeal sampling, but it is now the method that uh, basically is done worldwide. And what we now know of as COVID-19 testing, the at-home test, the antigen test, none of this would have been imaginable if we still had to collect nasal pharyngeal swabs from every single um, potential patient. So um, it's the non-invasive sampling is something that is um, not necessarily sufficient, but it is absolutely necessary for high throughput sampling. For TB, we have been evaluating for about the past 10 years uh, tongue swabs, oral swabs. Uh, we started with buccal swabs and we eventually went to uh, tongue swabs. And um, the advantage of that over sputum collection is, uh, uh, it seems obvious, but I'll talk a little bit more about how we know that later on. Um, over the years, we've optimized it. We found that uh, sampling the tongue dorsum works better than the buccal ep epithelium, which works better than the gums. Collecting in the early morning is, works a little bit better than collecting later in the day, which is the same with sputum samples. Um, flock swabs work better than, than scraper swabs. Uh, some of the people that have been involved with this from the start have been uh, Rachel Wood in my lab and Angelique Luabea um, at the South African Tuberculosis Vaccine Initiative. Um, sample mass is important, and we, one of the things that we found is that if you sample the tongue dorsum over and over again with um, basically any swab product, you don't get a depletion of the amount of signal. And here for signal, we're using um, uh, basically bacterial biomass, uh, uh, nonspecific bacterial uh, RDNA testing. And you really don't get any depletion. So every time we collect a swab, we're leaving most of the sample behind. And so using this proxy, we identified, we evaluated different swab products. And we found they're not all the same. Um, some of them work better than others, and some of them collect more of this biomass than others. And over the years, then, uh, with the combination of evaluating different sites, the, the buckle, the tongue dorsum, uh, versus different swab products, we've settled on a product that we think is um, the best. And it consistently collects more um, bacterial biomass and um, as a result of these different types of optimization, we've been going down from collecting uh, three swab series down to being able to collect a single swab per patient. And if the, um, if the sample is tested in a laboratory-based system, uh, we're getting pretty good sensitivity. Um, with pediatric TB, collecting sputum is extremely challenging. And um, we've evaluated a, a swab collection tongue swab collection in children. With children, it's kind of more of a slime swab. They just kind of chomp down on it. And, but um, basically, uh, uh, it's not, tongue swabs are not quite as sensitive as, um, as uh, sputum testing when you're able to uh, detect the uh, bacterium in sputum. In a lot of pediatric TB cases, you never detect the bacterium at all in sputum. But uh, often these children, based on symptoms and epidemiology and response to treatment, they're considered likely to have tuberculosis. And in fact, the tongue swabs work a lot better than sputum testing in these children. Uh, so in other words, the tongue swabs were able to detect a lot of suspected TB cases that were not detectable by, uh, by sputum testing. The, uh, by far the biggest, uh, the, the most widespread uh, PCR system that is used uh, commercially for uh, TB diagnosis is the Cepheid uh, Gene Expert Ultra. Now, the, the Expert Ultra is designed for sputum testing. It's not designed to test a swab sample. And uh, we and others have been working over the years to try to adopt the Expert for, uh, for, for swab testing. 
Um, I don't know if it's ever going to uh, if it's ever going to be quite optimum for swab testing. Maybe, but. Uh, Using the best methods we've identified, we find we're able to detect about uh, three quarters of people with active TB. In other words, three quarters of people with uh, sputum positive TB, um, we're also able to detect with, with tongue swabs. So um, that level is not 100%, but again, uh, when, you, when you consider the lessons we've learned from COVID-19, if you're able to expand the breadth of testing, which uh, tongue swabs could certainly uh, facilitate, we will, because of the improved yield, we will detect far more cases overall. So the, the, the notion of um, community-based testing, if we wanted to test everybody in this room, um, it, would, it wouldn't be possible if we had to collect sputum from you. It certainly wouldn't be possible if we had to collect blood. But um, tongue swabbing, actually, by the time the three of us got done talking, we could have tested all of you. <laughs> and uh, none of you would have had to get out of your seats. So um, that's, that's the idea with that. Um, three quarters, being able to detect three quarters of cases with the gene expert, that's important because gene expert is a system that uh, most TB controls uh, uh, programs have in their laboratories. But again, I want to reemphasize that you get much better sensitivity when you use methods that are specifically designed for swab testing. And in fact, our colleagues at the Global Health Laboratories, uh, Amy Stedman and, and, and others, have found uh, sensitivity close to 100% relative to sputum testing uh, when they use laboratory-based methods for testing tongue swabs. Um, so how are we going to get to the combination of these things, uh, a point of care system or near point of care system that is able to, det uh, to, um, to get this kind of sensitivity with tongue swabs. Um, as I mentioned, adapting uh, sputum testing systems has certain uh, challenges associating with it. So uh, I think the opposite attack, which is try to adopt or repurpose uh, swab testing systems for detecting tuberculosis um, might potentially be more productive. And um, we have actually uh, begun that, that process working with our collaborators at Northwestern University and uh, Minute Molecular. They have a SARS-CoV-2 test. It's one of many SARS-CoV-2 PCR tests that have been developed. This one's called the DASH system. Um, it's very rapid and easy to use. We, we've used a, a version of it for TV. Um, it's specifically designed for testing swabs. So the idea here is you take a swab. Um, by the way, the swabs, that, uh, the system, the, the method that we use, swabs are collected from the patients and stored dry in a tube. You can just take that, that swab, stick it in the cartridge, cap the cartridge and stick it in the machine, which is battery operated, and it gives you a result in 20 minutes. This is much faster and much easier than any other method that we have used with, with tongue swabs. Um, definitely faster and easier than the uh, uh, gene expert. Um, an important, uh, an important component of this, which I think is absolutely critical for any system for testing swabs for TB, there's only a tiny, basically a tongue swab sample is, is bacterial biofilm with just a few bacilli, TB bacilli in it. Um, so you really got to make sure you're testing that entire sample if you want to be able to consistently detect the bacilli. So it's important that um, you can't just take a, a, a half mil sample and test a few microliters of it. Um, the DASH system, the reason why we decided to evaluate this one is it has an internal magnetic particle concentration system. So basically it has magnetic particles that are coated with oligonucleotides that capture M tuberculosis DNA and concentrate it and then that entire sample gets tested. And uh, by using this method, we have sensitivities that are in the range that we see with our manual protocols, and also uh, based on a small sample of clinical samples, um, uh, we're in the uh, uh, sensitivity range that we see with, um, with uh, uh, manual protocols. This uh, was a hand-chosen sample set that had a lot of uh, very possibacillary uh, samples in it. So uh, finally, you know, um, uh, specimen quality is a question that is something that Marek brought up and that I asked Donatella about, 
with a swab, the, the, a challenge with sputum, you can tell a good sputum sample from a bad one by looking at it. It's not a pleasant process, but you can tell by looking at a sputum sample if it's a good sample or not. With a swab, you cannot tell a, a sample that has never been inside someone's mouth from one that hasn't. And when you start thinking about self-collection, um, this is something to be concerned about. Um, we have been using in our research a sample adequacy control that's just basically quantitative. We ask, uh, so again, th this is CQ value, so the lower the CQ value, the stronger the signal. Basically, swabs that have been inside a mouth uh, give much stronger, consistently stronger signals than uh, with, with a human mitochondrial DNA marker. So that's our internal control is the human mitochondrial DNA. You see much stronger signals with mouth swabs than with swabs that have just been handled in the hand. But that's still not quite good enough, right? Because I did mention that tongue swabs work better than cheek swabs, which work better than gum swabs. And so um, I'm, <laughs> this is something that uh, I'm still pondering is, is what is a good way to, to uh, do sample adequacy to really make sure that the swab has been on the tongue dorsum? Um, so maybe the uh, hive mind here, if anyone has any ideas, we'd love to hear about it. Um, this, this lady in this photo is my mother. <laughs> she was a U.S. Army nurse. Uh, she served in the Second World War. In fact, she was an officer. Um, she never talked much about the horrors she must have seen uh, being a frontline nurse. But uh, much later in life, when she found out that I was going into tuberculosis research, she told me that uh, the thing she, re she really hated most about her job was collecting sputum samples. Um, this is an N of one, albeit uh, a person who had never once lied to me. But uh, if we want to go to regulators and really try to document that uh, swabs are a preferred sampling method, we really need more um, systematic uh, uh, approaches. So uh, Rene Coetzee in my laboratory and others have begun to use uh, qualitative research methods, uh, mixed methods approaches to try to uh, get, get an idea of what type of sampling method is really preferred both by providers and by patients. So to summarize, we have steadily and incrementally approved oral swabs for testing. It's an easy procedure, universally tolerated, amenable to self-collection. Um, we can detect uh, about three quarters using the gene expert. Um, ongoing development to further improve sensitivity uh, uh, includes swab capacity, uh, improved gene expert ultra methods, improved laboratory based methods, and focus on swab testing platforms. And again, I'm hoping that the lessons we learned from COVID 19 can help pave the way for some of this. It just turned zero. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, we um, uh, sputum is one of our favorite swabs. I think vomit is slightly worse, but uh, uh, sputum is definitely so anything to avoid that. Are there any questions from anyone? We have one online, which is um, are you using the, the flop swab for the tongue swabs collection to facilitate the testing? The flock, are you using the flock swab? Yes. We're using, we're using uh, Copan flock swabs at the moment, and okay. we're evaluating, uh, also evaluating different types of swabs, too. We're always looking for something that, that can collect more of that material. Okay. Uh, if there are any other, any other thoughts? Uh, so um, I can ask a question, then. Um, so have you looked at other bacteria? Um, because obviously we use sputum for, you know, pneumococcus and um, Staph aureus and all sorts of other community-acquired and hospital-acquired pneumonia. Yeah, short answer, no. We're, we're a tuberculosis. Tuberculosis uh, yeah, specific. tuberculosis okay. lab. Um, okay. It's a good question, though. <laughs> yeah, because that would be, because again, um, sputum is, uh, is, a, is a challenge in that group. I will say it. that uh, some people have looked uh, for at non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, the challenge there is that there is a, a non-tuberculous mycobacterium in the human mouth. And um, just from exposure to the environment, exposure to drinking water, and so on, we have a certain background level of that. So with NTMs, everything's always more challenging for that reason. Very good. Right. Well, I think at the time being 1313, 13, 
Um, we'll call this session to an end because they apparently need to move the stage around for the next session. So thanks very much for all your attention for your, and everything. Thank you.